Hi everyone, welcome back to Connected Rheumatology. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz. Here at Connected Rheumatology, we talk about all things rheumatology, immunology, diet and movement, and mental health and wellness because we believe it's all connected. Today we're gonna to be talking about a much requested topic and that is discoid lupus. What is it? What does it look like? Will it progress to systemic lupus? What's the difference anyways? We're gonna talk about all of it. If you like this kind of information or know someone who could benefit from it, make sure you share, subscribe, like this video. It really helps us out a lot. So stick around, we're gonna talk about discoid lupus. All right, so the first thing I wanna just kinda of get out there, kind of like my disclaimer, is I'm a rheumatologist. I'm not a dermatologist. The way I look at rashes, the way I think about rashes, is going to be very different than a dermatologist. That being said, in rheumatology, we see a lot of skin conditions. We see a lot of skin rashes. We see, see skin lesions, and so there is some level of comfort that you just end up getting by being a rheumatologist. But as a rheumatologist, the way I look at it, when it comes to lupus and rashes, really all bets are off. But we're really not here today to talk about all the different types of rashes that can happen with lupus because there are so many. And like I said, it's probably beyond what I should be talking about anyway. What I wanna talk about today is discoid lupus. And we're going to go through a series of questions, the most common questions we get in the rheumatology office about discoid lupus. And we're gonna hopefully clear up some confusion points and um, give you guys some answers. Okay, number one, what is discoid lupus and is it different than SLE or systemic lupus? So discoid lupus is a chronic cutaneous condition, cutaneous simply means skin, that is distinct from SLE or systemic lupus erythematosus. The main difference is really just that. SLE is systemic. It affects the skin, but it affects almost every other system in the body. Whereas discoid lupus is really just a condition of the skin. Now, about 20% of those with SLE will also have discoid lupus or discoid lesions, but many will have only discoid lupus. In fact, most of those ultimately diagnosed with discoid lupus will never have SLE or never have symptoms concerning of SLE. And unless someone also has joint pain or fatigue or abnormalities in their blood work, many times those with discoid lesions will actually be seen by a dermatologist before they're seen by a rheumatologist. Okay, number two, who gets discoid lupus and why? So discoid lupus is commonly seen in women between the ages of 30 and 50. So it's a condition of the 30s and the 40s. And similar to SLE, there is a four times higher risk amongst black women to develop discoid lesions. And just like systemic lupus, black women tend to get diagnosed with discoid lupus at a younger, younger age and tend to have more severe cases. Now, the question as to why we develop discoid lupus is as complicated and frankly unknown as why we develop systemic lupus. There have been studies that show there is a correlation between cigarette smoking, between certain viruses, and between UV light exposure that may predispose or make someone more inclined to develop discoid lupus. But the truth is, we still don't know for sure, and the triggers for any one individual will probably differ from another individual. What does discoid lupus look like? Well, before we get into the actual rash or lesions of discoid lupus, I just want to make a note that when we use the word rash with lupus, I think it conjures up an image for most of us that's like a red, itchy, bumpy rash. And that's 
true in a lot of rashes with lupus and can be true even when we're talking about the classic butterfly rash. But when we're talking about discoid lupus, we don't tend to use the word rash because it isn't that red, itchy rash we think of. We use the word lesions. And I'm not a big fan of that word. I think it's like hyperclinical, but that's what we've got. So a discoid lesion will start as a round, raised red patch on the skin and oftentimes can be around the ears or on the face or on the scalp. And that lesion or the collection of lesions can then grow and expand. And as it grows, the outer rim of the lesion gets darker or we say hyperpigmented and the inner area of the lesion tends to get lighter or hypopigmented. And as it grows, that lighter area can get larger and the skin of that lighter area not only is lighter, but also gets thinner. So it's hypopigmented and atrophied. Now, depending on the original pigmentation of the skin that's being affected, it can be any number of colors, but it can be so hypopigmented or so light that you can start to see tiny blood vessels. Now, unfortunately, when a lesion has gotten to that stage where you start to have the lighter area, the lighter atrophied skin in the middle of the lesion, that is scarring. And in that scar, not only do you have lighter skin, but you will also have hair loss and it is permanent. So right away, you can see how this is very different than that classic butterfly rash we think of with systemic lupus. The butterfly rash and many other rashes with systemic lupus are red, they come and go, and they don't scar. With discoid lesions, these lesions look very different and even when treated and even when discoid lupus is quote unquote under control, you will still be left with this scar. And if there's any hair where that skin was, that hair unfortunately will not grow back. Now, discoid lupus can be either localized or disseminated, and it really depends on where the lesions are located of how you characterize it. So localized tends to be on the face, scalp, around the ears, and disseminated is defined if there are any lesions on the trunk or any, really, any lesions really below the neck. It is much more common to have localized discoid lupus. About 80% of people diagnosed with discoid lupus will be localized, leaving 20% to have disseminated. And lesions are often thought to be in what we call a photo distribution, meaning they show up in the parts of the skin that are exposed to UV light. But that's not always the case. We can certainly see discoid lesions on the trunk or other areas of the body that don't typically get UV light. How do I know if I have discoid lupus? Well, as I said, depending on the symptoms that you have, if you have fatigue, joint pain, or any other lab abnormalities, it's quite possible that you are then sent to a rheumatologist and the rheumatologist will be the one to kind of look over your skin and might be the one to diagnose discoid lupus. If you don't have any of those symptoms, then and you just have this lesion and you don't know what it is, then it's very common to be seen by a dermatologist. Now, the rashes and, and lesions of discoid lupus are very much a know it and see it, sorry, a see it and know it kind of lesion, meaning that dermatologists and rheumatologists are trained to be able to identify these lesions and based on what they look like, might be able to tell you what it is just from looking at it. In some cases, it's not quite so clear and your dermatologist might then need to get a skin biopsy. And they take a small section of skin, like tiny, tiny section of skin, from the area affected and then they send it to the pathology lab so the pathologist can then look at it under a microscope and see if it has any of the key findings that they would expect to see in someone with discoid lupus. Will my discoid lupus progress to systemic lupus? This is by far and away the most common question I get and the short answer is most likely not. The majority of patients diagnosed with discoid lupus will continue to only have discoid lupus. However, it's not 
And it's because it's not 100% that I will always advocate that anyone with a diagnosis of discoid lupus deserves to have a head to toe once over by a rheumatologist. Now, I know I'm biased, but I still think it's super important. Sometimes we can miss things or we can maybe underappreciate lab changes that could actually indicate the presence of systemic lupus. And as I said, about 20% of those with SLE will have discoid lesions. So you definitely don't want to miss something. Now, it is very possible that a discoid lupus patient goes and sees a rheumatologist, gets the top head to toe evaluation and gets told there's nothing going on, go back to your dermatologist and God bless. But I do think there's value in having that evaluation. Now, there are some studies to show that people who have a particularly high ANA or who have joint pain or have any family history of anyone else with SLE are at higher risk of quote unquote progressing to SLE. The risk of progressing to SLE is actually highest in the first 10 years and even more so in the first five years. So if you have discoid lupus and you kind of pass that 10 year benchmark, then chances are really high that you are not going to develop any kind of systemic lupus. It's also not uncommon for people to have discoid lupus and also have an ANA. And that does not mean that they have systemic lupus or that they're at a higher risk of systemic lupus. It really depends on how high that ANA is, how persistent that high ANA is, and if there are any other symptoms going on. And again, this is why I always advocate to go get a head to toe eval by your rheumatologist. I have systemic lupus and now have discoid lupus. Is there anything special I need to know? Well, protecting yourself from UV light just got even that much more important. Now, if you've watched any of my other lupus videos, which if you haven't, you should, and I'll put the links in the description box below. But if you've watched any of those, you will know that protecting yourself against UV light is super important at protecting yourself from lupus flares. And the same is true for discoid lesions. As I said before, it appears that UV light may have a role in actually the pathogenesis or the reason why these lesions appear. So you want to be extra careful with your SPF, with your protective clothing, and just really staying out of UV light. What treatments are there for discoid lupus? So as you can imagine, early diagnosis and early treatment is really key with this diagnosis. You want to put in place good practices as far as avoiding UV light, using SPF and protective clothing. And as we talked about, once those lesions get large and you start seeing skin thinning and color changes, that can indicate scarring that is not reversible and that's something that we want to prevent. Now, depending on where a lesion is, depending how fast it's growing, how big it is, all of those factors will really depend on how your doctor approaches it. And for the most part, just like with anything, we always try to go with the treatment that's gonna give us the biggest bang for our buck. So what is going to take care of this problem and really without having to take on the highest risks as far as side effects and those kinds of things. And when we're dealing with any kind of cutaneous only condition, we really like to keep our treatments to the skin only. So we have creams and we have ointments and we also can do intralesional injections of steroids and other medications to try to cut down the inflammation that's going on in that lesion and stop it from growing. Again, depending on the severity, depending on where the lesions are, it may come to a point to where you're talking to your doctor about some sort of oral or systemic therapy. And just like with systemic lupus, we use medicines like hydroxychloroquine and methotrexate to try to get at the altered immune system that is really driving this condition and driving these lesions. But again, it really depends on 
how many lesions you have, how big are they, how fast are they growing, and all of those things. Is discoid lupus life-threatening? No, thankfully it's not. Now, that doesn't mean that discoid lupus can't be incredibly challenging and incredibly disturbing. Again, these lesions, depending on where they are, can really have a large impact on someone's life. But thankfully, this is a condition that doesn't affect anything but the skin. And so, as a result, it's not life-threatening. All right, so those were some quick answers to some very common questions about discoid lupus. I hope it helped clear some confusion up. I know that we hear the word lupus and we tend to always think the worst, but it's not always the same and discoid lupus is actually a very different beast than systemic lupus, and it's important to know the difference. Um, I'm always going to advocate that if you've been diagnosed with discoid lupus, that you set up an appointment with a rheumatologist just to get the top, top down, head, toe, right, left, full 360 evaluation just to make sure there's nothing else going on. And then once you've had that done, you can check that box and go back to your dermatologist and not worry again about it. Because as I said, most people with discoid lupus will never have to worry about systemic lupus, thankfully. So I hope you liked this video. I hope it answers some of your questions. Um, if you know someone who could benefit from this information, make sure you share it. If you like hearing about this kind of stuff, hit subscribe, like this video, hit that bell notification. You know, here at Connected Rheumatology, we talk about all things rheumatology, immunology, diet and movement, and mental health and wellness because it's all connected. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.